time. All right, I think we're I think we're rolling. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna let me just pop on to these pages to see if we are live. Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah, looks like we're live. All right. Hello, everybody. Peter Grosso here, also known as Pocket Pete, here with the great Lee Friedman. Uh, I've known Thanks, Lee. Pete. <laughs> hey, Lee. <laughs> I've known you longer than I've been uh, a real estate agent or a broker. Yeah, you were. You bought. You bought shorts. Yeah. What yeah. for that I that I negotiated? Yeah. Like years and years and years ago. Yeah, like I think uh, I found an email from us from 2012. I think. Yeah, that's when you were you you were buying up stuff in Detroit. I think. Yeah. Or at least looking into it. Yeah, Detroit and Rochester was uh, was my, yeah. uh, my spot. I owned maybe 20, 25 or thirty houses in Detroit at one at, at one time. Really? Yeah. yeah. You were telling me that you were buying blocks at a time with those sales. Yeah, some of you get for five hundred bucks. You know, it's so like even if the, the it didn't work. You let that one go, you know. Right. So, uh, but just having kids changed everything, you know. I, didn't I, I hear, I hear you, I hear you. So, um, all right. So let's let's talk short sales. Let's we we have um we're on two forums. We're on my private Remax forum for you know all the people in my office that you know, and then we're also in a Long Island Mastermind forum. So there may be some people here that haven't been in your class so i don't know if you want to give like a quick overview for maybe there's some newbies out there or some people that don't deal in short sales give me just a quick overview of what a short sale is and how it works sure um so basically uh you know a short sale at its at its core is just uh selling a house for essentially what it's what it's worth not what is owed um the criteria is pretty simple you can't afford the house is worth less than you owe and you can't afford to pay the amount. That's it. There's no special hardships or anything like that that you require. Um, I know we've talked in the past about, you know, I've gotten senior VPs at at, at big banks who make $400,000 a year and we've been able to get them short sales. So it's really the, the hardship is not really the key. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just in my experience, you know, I, I start out um, you know, I do a lot of short, I do a lot of uh, foreclosure defense and, and uh, loan mods and stuff like that. And really what's happened is um, a lot of these people just have been modified, done the foreclosure defense, et cetera. They just can't afford their houses, um, especially on Long Island. It's a big problem because the carrying costs are just very high. Even if you had zero, a zero percent mortgage, um, you know, your escrows are 1200 bucks a month. So if you're on a fixed income, it becomes impossible for you to keep your house here. Um, so, um, so essentially the process of a short sale is, and I know a lot of realtors are afraid of it, um, because they've heard nightmares. Um, they, you know, they're not sure if it's something that they want to get themselves into. Um, and one of the reasons why, you know, my office is pretty successful at this is because we you know, we have an itch, um, you know, back before I really got into it, the realtors themselves were trying to negotiate with the banks, the short sales. And it's not a good use of time, energy, effort for a realtor to be negotiating with a bank. Um, realtors are good at listing and, and selling and buying houses. Um, attorneys are good at, or at least the attorneys that I know, I, I, I count myself among them, are good at negotiating. Um, and dealing with bank and dealing with bureaucracy and red tape and stuff like that. Um, so essentially, um, that's that that's the void that we fill. Um, just just as far as background, like how I do short sales, um, the way that we do it is we represent this, the sellers in the transaction. Uh, we don't charge the sellers anything. Um, we are basically retained just to work the short sale, and we get paid out of proceeds of the short sale. Um, and we're you know allotted our our fee or Usually it's not the full fee, but some of the fee um, on the out of the transaction, out of the proceeds. Mm -hmm. So the realtors are essentially getting their six percent because uh, that's one thing. If you list the short sale, you have to list it at six percent. It's a lot more work. It's not necessarily going to close. And as a listing agent, you should you deserve four percent. Um, and I'd say ninety nine percent of the time we're able to protect that. Um, and then um, you know, and then once the process goes, really what we're doing is. We're gathering financial docs from the seller to show that they don't have the financial wherewithal to pay it. Um, 
we're submitting, you know, we need a lot of documents from lenders. Some of the servicers work in Equator. Some of the servicers, you know, the Fannie Mae has the home path. So uh, there's different ways to negotiate with the different banks and servicers. And then um, once everything's all submitted with a contract of sale and the financial docs, they order a, a BPO. Um, and then essentially they send the BPO agent. And unfortunately, um, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody here who might be a BPO agent, but um, they're really, you know, for the small amount of money that a BPO agent gets, um, they're not getting a full blown appraisal. The lenders don't want to pay for a full blown appraisal. So what unfortunately winds up happening is they do a CMA. Um, they don't have necessarily the background to assess cost to cure, you know, fixing things and, and defects in the house and how to, uh, you know, diminish value based upon that. So what oftentimes happen is the bank comes back, they, they um, give us, they give, you know, they, they counter or they accept the number. And then if the, if the bank is way off, we'll put in our own appraisal with our own contractors, estimates, et cetera, to see if we could get to a point at which it's a reasonable number. Um, obviously, with a lot of these short sales, um, they a lot of them start off as investor deals. Um, sometimes the bank is so um, unreasonable about fees, about what they're looking for. Um, they, they, they're still saleable, but sometimes they're more open market and user type of deals. And on those deals, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's looking for their own home can still get a very good deal, sub market value. Um, it's just they have to have this stomach for the process and uh, there's no guarantees in it at all. Okay. So, um, a couple questions. Well, one thing I want to highlight is a lot, I know a lot of real estate agents that don't use shorts, like, like, like Friedman and, um, and Mike and, uh, Mike and Lee, um, they either want to save their own commission. Like I know a lot of attorneys will take a either portion of the commission or they feel like they need to control everything. What I think is great about you, this is, this is your niche. So, um, and you don't charge the agent anything. So they get to take that off their plate. Just put the, you, you handle most of the deal and you're in contact and you give guidance on what we need to do. And that's, that's helped me tremendously through any of the deals that we've done. Yeah. I mean, especially with listings and stuff, it's, it's hard to, you know, especially I have a lot of agents who come to me after they've try to list the property, the short sale didn't work out. And then we'll sort of do a post-mortem and see why their first time around or why the client's first time around didn't work. And the reason is because it, in a lot of respects, it wasn't done properly. So the, the way that I say, the reason why I say that is, especially at the list, you know, if the bank is looking for, I'm just throwing a number out, 450, if you put it out on the MLS at 325 and take your investor offer at 275, there's 0% chance that we're going to make any headway with them because it's not even in the ballpark. So if if the number to start is not in the ballpark, then you, we're, we're working against ourselves. However, if we know that the bank, let's say the bank, or we think that the bank might be looking for a, a number with a four in front of it. So start at 405 and five days later, drop it to 385 and then keep dropping it until it's it, it, until it's within reason um and then obviously you know if it's if it's marketed you'll find somebody um and then if it's a if it's one of those you know uh investor type of deals there will be a number at which it makes sense and we could back up the low offer that we're submitting to the lender um so you're, you're saying like show a history that no one's buying that no. correct correct i have one i have one that was um I'm not going to say, but I have, I have one that was taken from another agent and one of your agents is now listing it new. Oh, and, uh, and it was the same exact thing. The realtor negotiated a deal herself. The numbers were completely out of whack. She didn't submit any cost to cure. She didn't submit any, uh, their, our, their own appraisal, our own appraisal. She didn't submit any of that stuff. So now we have no buyer and the, the number is ridiculous. So now I talked to your agent and we're going to list it at the number that the bank wanted, the absurd number. And every week we're just going to drop it <laughs> until we find someone. And this is not an investor type of deal. This is an end user deal. And the number didn't make sense. Um, but at least if we could show a listing history and the drop in price, um, we could at least substantiate the fact that we tried to market it where the bank wanted it. And it just didn't. It, it, and, and, and we got somebody who's within reason. And like I said, you're never going to, 
you know, it do, a short sale doesn't necessarily make sense at exactly market value. So there has to be value in it because there is things in dents. There aren't the same warranties, promises, you know, guarantees, uh, representations that are made related to a short sale. But you could still get a very good deal. And especially on a, uh, you know, sometimes with a short sale um, and people don't realize that if you have um, buyers who are FHA, who really can't afford a done house, you know, there are 203K loans. There are there are programs where a first time home buyer can get a fixer upper and they, they're probably going to find the best value in something like a short sale. Um, I often shy people away from REOs just because there are almost no representations made and it's very hard to deal sometimes with the lenders when they already own the houses. But on a short sale, essentially it's a straight transaction. We're just getting the bank to agree to a certain number that makes sense. So a couple of things, just can you define cost to cure for those that are uh, watching? Is it a term we've used a few times here? Sure. Um, so essentially what, it, what the, the, when I say cost to cure, I'm really looking at, you know, what, what needs to be put into the house to make it why house? You know, the problem is, is that if the house is, if the house is full of mold, it's got, a, it's got structural damage and the roof has a hole in it. A BPO agent has absolutely no ability. And this is not their fault. They're just, it's just not their thing. An appraiser might be able to, a contractor might be able to, but a BPO agent is not in the position to assess the fact that, you know, this house needs 60 to $70,000 just to make it a crappy house. You know, and and that's the problem. You know, and 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 ultimately, what what winds up happening is is that if the if the B, if the number comes in too high, and we don't present them with the information, then when they do the comps, and essentially just winds up being a CMA, you don't know house A to house B. You don't know that our house is. You know, I had a house once that they were giving us a very high number in the Rockaways that got hit multiple times by was uninhabitable. It was, and, and we kept, we kept laughing about it. It was like Jumanji. That's what this house was like, but they kept giving us numbers that were based upon a livable house. This was a house that was basically a shell. And until we were able to, um, to get to a point where they were fully understood that the number was just way too high. So do we submit, uh, cause I, I, I think we did this with a, a house in Shirley a couple of weeks ago. Um, we, su we submitted a contractor's estimate, right? Uh, does that Correct. work? Yes, it, it always it always worked with a full breakdown. I mean, look, it, it really is investor to investor. It's servicer to servicer. Like I could just tell you off the bat, like there's one there's one servicer, Rushmore. They're horrible at this. Rushmore basically will pick a number out of the, take the BPO's number. I could give them an, a, pr a full blown appraisal with contractor estimates and everything. They stick to their guns. Excuse me. So it's very difficult. Um, uh, like for instance, a uh, caliber caliber does not do short sales caliber, um, as a servicer, um, they're a portfolio servicer. They keep their own loans and they're frankly, well, I don't know what's going on with with this COVID stuff, but up until this point, they're trying to get into the real estate market. So they'll give you uh, $10,000 potentially, uh, you know, cash for keys, but they're not letting you do a short sale. But for the, for the most part, they'll all do it. And definitely the more information you have, look, I think it's a little bit of overkill, but I know some attorneys who go and find the sex offender list and will, and will, will send a map of all the sex offenders in the surrounding area, what level they're at, all the crime in the sur surrounding area, anything you could do to convince the lender that the numbers are wrong. Um, is it, it sure, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it works in, with some, in some respects, but really the more important thing is to show the fact that the house itself is just not worth it. I have a question here on the forum. Uh, does the bank disclose to the agent slash attorney of what the number they're looking for, and will they tell you this before and after the short sale on MLS? Uh, there's only one circumstance where they where you will submit. You don't have to submit a contractor or a binder, and you can get a number, and that's with FHA. So if somebody has an FHA loan, FHA basically has a pre foreclosure program, which essentially is you submit the financial docs for the for the seller. And they will say, we must net X dollars. Their, their X dollar is 88% of fair market value. So whatever, but again, it's what they perceive as fair market value. That's where the key is. 
So it's super important to make sure the value is proper. Um, and then they say, we want to net 88% of fair market value. And if that means cutting the legal fee, cutting the realtors, th they don't care. Um, and then, you know, there's some other things that have to, you know, but other than that, you well, must they submit. Do they do a BPO or do they? they do a BP they'll do a BPO without a contract. Okay, interesting. So we can we can call them and say, hey, we're about to short sell this. Will you send someone to do a BPO? We'll, so we'll fill out the paperwork. We'll submit it to them. And FHA will give you a number of what they need. Um, and then you could go out and, you know, full-blown market it. You could do that with an FHA loan. None of the other loan programs or servicers or, well, well it's not servicer by servicer, but none of the other loan programs will, will give you numbers without getting, without giving them like a firm deal in order, because again, they, even though they're they're paying their BPO agents fifty or seventy five bucks, they won't they don't want to spend the time, energy, and effort if you don't have something on the table. Um, so they're not going to do it. What they ultimately will do is, um, you know, obviously they want to see as much as possible, and that's what. And one thing we definitely try to do um, in my office is, and and I know it sometimes frustrates people that we don't submit incomplete packages, but we want to submit everything at the same exact time because if we don't, then they say this is stale, that's stale. You have to update this. It's better if we submit everything because then within a couple of weeks they could say, okay, um, we want to schedule the BPO. And then we call up the agent, uh, the listing agent, and the listing agent could could assist with that. And and while I'm uh, sort of on this, and is it's really important when you when you have a short sale that you are at the BPO, you must be at the BPO because again, the BPO agent doesn't necessarily know all the, the issues with the house. Um, you need to be there to make sure that the that the, the house is 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 valued based upon what it is and that they see all the defects in the house. Um, I don't know what's going to wind up happening with this COVID stuff. I, I'm sure that people are going to be skittish about going into houses, but you know, even, even, even before that, you know, some of these houses are in really bad shape. They're covered in mold. BPO agents do not want to go into houses that are covered with mold. So number one, as a courtesy, you're letting them know, but number two, um, you know, if they're not going to go in and they're not going to figure it out, I mean, obviously a motor remediation could be very expensive if it's covering the whole house. Um, they need to, they need to know that. Um, and you need to make sure that they know that there's mold issues, that there's roofing issues, that there's X, Y, and Z. And and sometimes I have some agents who are actually, if we're not submitting, because we don't know if the, if the, where the bank's head is at with the value. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll have those contractor estimates and things like that at the, with the, um, with the agent, at the BPO, you give that to the BPO agent so maybe they can incorporate that into the value when they're presenting it to the bank. So you don't even have to go back to the bank. It could just be part of the BPO process. Interesting. Okay, so um, with uh, so just to, just to touch back on that on that last question. So basically, for every other deal, the process is list the house, get a get a buyer, submit it to the bank, and then we find out what you know what price they're looking for correct so usually you know you have an offer you submit the offer with the contract with the mls listing with all that stuff it's all you know it's all sent over to the lender the lender does their bpo and then once the bpo comes back they say it's like a yay nay or counter um you know most of the time there's a counter um but you hope when the bank counters it's you know it's twenty thousand dollars off of your number as opposed to you know one hundred and twenty thousand dollars off of your number so we had we you know we have a deal going on right now where, we, where the um the, the bank countered with um with a price plus said wait let's wait night what they say i think they said 90 days to see what offers come in with this covid thing do you think if no one's no one's making offers because they're not going to it do you think the original investor is going to win the house you think, or the, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, uh, you even, that's the thing, even on the flip side, you know, sometimes, and I guess we can work this in some of the, some of the lenders like um, Mr. Cooper and uh, I guess new res now they, they, they have proprietary online auctions houses. And what they do is that even if you have an offer and it's accepted and the bank likes your number, sometimes they make you put it up, up on one of those. But invariably, if you are, and if your buyer has been to the house and knows exactly what the house is, somebody who sight unseen is not, I mean, I've seen it like one time sight unseen going to pay more than that person who knows the house. Right. They're coming in with low numbers. So unless you have no offer, usually you're, you're, 
your your buyer is going to be the buyer on the deal if the numbers if the number is closer to the numbers met. And with this COVID stuff, nobody knows. I mean, look, in New York, can't you can't you can't do an inspection? Like I was saying to you before, I, I had to add all this COVID language to my contracts because all the deadlines. Who knows? You know, we, we have to toll the dates. If I say, you know, your mortgage commitment needs to be forty five days from contract, if we enter into contract, and you know, that you can't do an inspection for four weeks from now. They're not going to be able to do an appraisal. I mean, some of the lenders are allowing drive-by appraisals, um, yeah. but but still, or, or pictures from the from the yep. cell. They're taking pictures. They're allowing doing that. They're doing. They're doing. They're they're taking old v- v- verification of employment. I think that's crazy. I mean, all these people. It's thirty three point two million people applied for unemployment last week. I mean, I get all the time. I have pe- like I have constantly. My inbox is filled with clients saying, "I lost my job. What am I going to do?" I said, unfortunately, either we wait this out like everybody else, you become gainfully employed. I'm talking on the buy side and you're gainfully employed or alternatively, you're going to get declined by the bank. And unfortunately, what's going on in the world is going to prevent you from buying this house. I mean, it's just it's just we can't control nature. Right. Right. It's incredible. Um, yeah, I've, we've had quite a few deals that have either been incredibly shaky just because either fear the economy, like a couple of lost jobs, um, and just just plain fear where people just like, we've had, I have one deal where both, all three parties, cause it's a sale, it's a they're selling their house and they're buying something. We have three parties that agreed to just take a 30 day breather and say, all right, let's, let's take a break. Everyone's panicking. Let's, it's almost like the stock market stop, you know, like when they, yeah. Uh, the this 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 the stop button yeah your pause it's a pause let's take a breather and let's see where we look in 30 days mm-hmm. uh so it's it's just I mean, that, that's a that's a that's a smart way to go and and you know sort of while we're on this topic another thing is you know going towards the with with distressed property short sales and stuff like that from the investor perspective so most of the hard money lenders have paused financing the ones who are still doing it are char- are are charging a premium. Their the points are up like two points per deal. The loan to value ratios are going down, and they're lending less money per deal. So, um, if you as a realtor, if any of you realtors have cash, true cash buyers, this could be a good opportunity for a cash investor to get some deals. Just because you can't go into the house, and if you're you know, expecting the house to be in terrible shape, um, and you and you have cash, it actually could be a good opportunity because we don't know when when you know when the when the private lending market is going to you know start up again. Especially because most of that's backed by Wall Street capital, and if the Wall Street is going all over the place, you know these hedge funds are not necessarily going to start making these loans for fix and flip and stuff like that. So it's right. just another point yeah. to make. It's yeah, it's so there. Yeah, there's definitely going to be. Some opportunities, and and there there's a lot of views. There's, we're gonna have a quick snap back in the next few months once we're we get out there and you know we start generating, uh, you know, momentum and 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 get some get some uh, positive action going again. I think could be a great opportunity for some people to pick some stuff up. I do know one hard money lender uh, that is still lending. I checked in with them, so if anyone wants to PM me if they need something, I'll you know I'll, I'll make the connections. Yeah, uh, I, I talked I talked to one also that actually still does it. Um, and they 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 are they charge they're charging a five thousand dollar vig on top of what they usually charge. Plus, they said they'll continue to lend as long as the county clerks are recording mortgages. That that's their caveat. Right, and then, they're not recording yeah. mortgages and they're not doing anything. Yeah, I mean, and that's I've heard that from a few title companies too. They're saying like they don't know if if the clerk stops, we're gonna we're all just frozen. Um, right, because how long are you gonna hold that stuff in escrow, and how long are you gonna be responsible for it? And yeah. what if somebody jumps in and has a has a jumps in and has you know has a twenty five thousand dollar judgment that they haven't recorded that they're going to jump in in front of you as soon as they, they they turn it back on and now you have a now you have a bar claim I mean it's it's the kind of thing where it's it's pretty scary for a title company look they had those co- they they came out last week with all all the the um the under the title underwriters came out with those COVID affidavits and everyone's like I'm not signing COVID affidavit. So basically what happened is they're all taking the risk in order to stay in business. These title underwriters are just taking the risk and not forcing people to basically give an affidavit for the gap. Um, 
look, this is something that no one, none of us have ever experienced. So um, obviously people are trying to mitigate any potential risk, but then on the flip side, if, if that means you're not doing business, I think that's a small price to pay in a lot of respects. Yeah. So what are you saying out there as far as like closings are concerned? Like what do they look like right now? All right. So, so I'm, I'm doing closing still. Um, some closings have been like two people in a room with masks and gloves and then the title closes there. I'm trying to do everything as remotely as possible. So like, for instance, um, when it comes to contract signing, I'm trying to do it like on zoom or something like this, where the con where I send the contract to the client, um, th we review it together. Um, they can email it and send it. Um, no one's expecting, you know, wet signatures anymore. Um, especially when it comes to stuff with that closings, some of the lenders are being much more flexible when it comes to doing everything in counterparts and, uh, you know, basically doing everything in escrow, sending everything over to the title company or to the bank. Um, and then once everything is together and approved then funding, um, that seems to be the way we're going. I actually, um, obviously they're, you know, the, the governor is, governor is now allowing for um, e-notaries. Um, so essentially the way that that would work, and this is for your realtors too, or notaries, all you have to do is the person who you're notarizing must be in New York State. They must show you their valid New York State driver's license. They must sign it, show you they're signing it, scan an email to you. You could stamp it, scan and email them back, and the originals just need to be presented within 30 days. And look, if we're not to get, if, if this lasts more than 30 days, they might extend it. And then essentially you can notarize things that way. Um, I actually, um, later on today or tomorrow, I just uh, bought an, a seminar on, uh, on doing e-closings. Because I, I don't know. I mean, we might just, because I represent banks too. I don't know if we're going to move towards e-closings. I mean, the one good thing, uh, the one good thing about all of this, well, besides for spending a lot of time with your family, I'm the, actually, yeah. actually a good and bad thing, but that's, that's good. Actually quality time with your family, yeah. <laughs> even though, you know, my eight and four year olds are making me crazy. It's all right. Um, but the other thing is that this is going to be, this is pushing technology really far. I know Pete, you're, you know, you're a very big proponent of technology and this is really going to push it because look, things in the world happen. This has never happened before, but we might as well, we, we need to be ready if something like this happened or make just life easier by being able to do things remotely. Yeah, they look. I um, and if everyone has any questions, you know, put them into the, put them into the chat. But um, yeah, I that's one. I I agree with you. I think we were talking about this yesterday, where uh, local governments are ten years behind at least, and they're realizing they have to be realizing that they can't be this way anymore. So that they're gonna we're gonna have uh, a change in laws I think, this year and and hopefully next year where it just becomes a lot easier to work remotely because we're. You know, it, real estate agents are super efficient. We're on our phones every, you know, my wife can tell you my phone rings and texts and it's, you know, where I'm scanning for my phone. I never take a closing disclosure anywhere. You know, I, I, I try to have no paper um, and the world's going that way. And the one thing that's holding it up is local governments. So I think right. it's going to help a lot. I mean, look in the city, you know, Acris is a much more user friendly, pro, you know, system that you could just basically the you could have a you could have a, you know you, they don't even, even really need the originals you know they just need to make sure that they're that everything's inputted properly and you know they really should move towards that yeah um, it allows more flexibility absolutely um all right and so um if nobody has any questions lee you have anything else to add i want to i want to just say something about you mm -hmm. um one of the great things about uh lee uh and and uh he's got he's got a guy that works for him or i don't know, for or with but Mike, with, with, with yeah, okay. hopefully say Mike works with me. Mike, um, Mike works with Lee, uh, and he will help. He will help you, all of you agents with consultations for a short sale. So if you have someone who's behind in the mortgage, they're not sure what to do. Um, you'll you can, and you're not totally sure how to sit down and discuss it with them. You can have an expert in the field. Um, you can just call, you know, and, and contact me for, uh, and I'll and I'll put it in this Lee Lee and Mike's contact info. But you can set up an appointment with Mike, and he'll teleconference in. He'll he'll sit by the phone, and he will be part of that conversation so that the potential seller knows what they're what they're getting into, what their interests are, how and why it would protect them, and why it might be the best thing best thing for them is the short sale. So. 
Yeah, and, and and you know it's you know the, the way that I you know when I when I see these distressed homeowners, everything's on a for me it's on a continuum. So obviously the first thing is for ninety five percent of these people, you still have this small percentage like I don't want this house anymore or the divorce the, the divorcing couple they're like we just need to get rid of this house. Most people first inclination is let's see if we could save the house. Well, I, I've I've done thousands of months. So I could look at a, I could look at financials. I could look at a mortgage statement and essentially tell you what I think as far as whether or not it's possible. Like for instance, if you have two percent and they've already deferred thirty percent of your mortgage balance and you're you're behind ten months, it's a math and you have like a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. It's a math, math mathematical impossibility to get a mod because it, the programs don't exist because you've maxed out the program. So next step is can you do a Chapter Thirteen bankruptcy? Well, most people, if you can't afford your regular mortgage payment, you can't afford your regular mortgage payment plus one sixtieth of, of the arrears plus 10%. So it becomes an unaffordable thing. So obviously the next natural step is let's get you out of the situation as unscathed as possible with a, a, with a little disruption as possible. And a short sale is way less disruptive than the foreclosure process. You know, you put a sign in the front lawn, you're selling your house. You don't have to tell your children that it's a short sale, you know, you just, you explain to them that you know we we're moving and and that's it and unless you have much older kids where you need to get deeper than that um you know it, it, it's it's a much and also you know the simple fact is you know post short sale um it's looks on your credit like settled settled to debt for less than his owed, just like a credit card theoretically so two years post short sale you know you could qualify for another month provided your other financiers are online you you could qualify for another mortgage so it's it's a way to sort of stop the bleeding and let you move on with your life and when you when you're able to present it in that way and not just you know you need to sell your house you need to sell your house um and they've and you've gone through all the options and you've landed on the short sale invariably they're going to be much more appreciative and they're going to sign with you than the people who are just all over them getting, you know, the lists of people who are served with the list pendants and saying, sell me your house, sell me your house. There's a, there's a, there's a tact and there's the way to do it in order to get the clients. Right. Um, and they could potentially get moving expenses. Yeah. I mean, the banks have become stingier with that, but when they do do it, it's uh, usually a $3,000 reload assistance. So like for instance, last week I had three, three short sale closings, Two had the three thousand reload. One did not. Um, it all depends. It also also depends on if there's other impediments. Because if there's a second mortgage, if they're much more, you know the the rule of thumb is second mortgage holders get six thousand dollars. That's sort of the sort of what uh, essentially the is the, the the industry standard. So even if you have a two hundred thousand dollars second mortgage, they'll take six thousand dollars because they're going to get zero if they foreclose on it, um, and they write the rest off their books. Um, and then another question that people often have relates to tax debt and ten ninety nines. The government recently retroactively passed um, reinstituted the Mortgage Forgiveness Debt Act, um, which if it's your primary residence, you don't have to pay any tax on the quote unquote gain. But also the, you know, there's a, most of these people are upside down on life um, as far as finances are concerned. So um, if you're insolvent and uh, most most of these people are, I'd say 99 percent are, um, they could avoid paying tax on any 1099 they might get out of this transaction anyhow. And what I tell people is um, obviously I'm not an, an accountant. I don't tell give you a, accounting advice. But what I do tell them is, you know, after a short sale, when you're doing your taxes for the next year, don't go to an H and R block or tax preparer. Go to an actual CPA because there's ways to sort of wipe out any potential tax liability you might have. Okay, terrific. Um, all right, I I'm I'm out of questions. Do you have anything else that we should know about this world we're in or short sale? Nope. Everybody, everybody, stay safe and stay sane. I think that's the bigger issue. Yeah. <laughs> stay sane. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just keep try to keep busy and. You know, I, I know uh, it's sort of tough, but, you know, I was talking to, to Pete about uh, some of the, um, you know, some of the, the ways that, you know, you're trying to virtually do walkthroughs and stuff like that. I know uh, what Nicole in your office has, you know, is, is, is up on that stuff, you know, doing showings and stuff like that, um, you know, virtually and having the homeowner walk through. I mean, look, you know, there are things that we're going to need to do, like especially walkthrough. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea to have the seller walk through and through FaceTime or whatever, 
turn on and off the stove, turn on and off, you know, the, the boiler. I mean, that's what you have to do. I mean, if you want to buy your house right now, that's what you're going to have to do. Yeah, and it's and better I, to do that than do nothing or hold the deal off. Yeah. And, and it's a gray area and it might be stopped any second now too, just because, you know, we, there could be, um, there could be uh, more rulings coming down from MLS, but right now we're just trying to be as creative as possible. But I think, I think, a lot of things we're going to be frozen for a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. Unfortunately, I think I think it's gonna it's gonna freeze. I think um, the interpretation of the rules are going to be more in person as they as the more as as the more COVID decisions come down. Right. Uh, but you know, I personally believe you are you can protect your client even if you're there virtually and you set the rules. About who you know with between the seller and the buyer should the, se the seller should stay obviously six to ten feet away um, if you know if we were able to work out something like that and then set the ground rules for what can be discussed you can ask how old the roof is you cannot ask you know why you moving or you know will you know will you take right um, or or even or even small things like if you're trying to close and you're trying to you know make sure everything's working in a walkthrough right if if you virtually do a quote unquote virtual walkthrough hold back a thousand dollars let's just say yeah. as an escrow and then once you get possession you know then it could be released as long yeah. as it's satisfactory the you know the band-aid version you know yeah. the virtual version is is and i i think that's a that's a those sorts of things are reasonable and under the circumstances we got to figure out yeah. what's re you know what we can do yeah and we have to finish the pipeline i mean we might we might have a real hard time getting stuff started for the next six weeks to two months but mm -hmm. We got to finish. We got to be creative about finishing the pipeline. Exactly. Lot. And look on the lending side, it's tough. I mean, I have, uh, you know, I, I know I have a friend who's a who's a, who's a, a big um, LO for Chase, and he he's got thirty deals in his pipeline that he cannot close. He cannot close. I mean, so these are, but it's not only his thirty deals. Here's thirty buyers who are ready to buy houses who cannot because their lender is not lending. I mean, it's it's a crazy, and they have to sort of. I think every day they're trying to figure out these rules and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, um, because you know the housing market can't just come to a complete stop. Right. So, and and unfortunately, us in New York, like New York metropolitan area, we're going to be the last one to let out. Right. So right. first one in, last one out. So you know that's the thing. Like you know, they might be able right. to get out. You know, April sixth in Kentucky, but we we're not getting out. I, I, my fingers are crossed. Sometime in the middle, like sometime in May. I mean, I, that's what I hope. You might want to switch you know? to the divorce attorney after the. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, you got. If you have a small house, I feel bad for you. <laughs> oh, I'm. A, I, have a, I have a nice basement that I can. That's that where. Can... Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it can't, it's you know people say a man cave, whatever. No, it just needs to be the parent cave. Right. So the parents can get away from the children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So all right, uh, Lee Stacy. So if anybody has any question, uh, Pete has my info. Um, you know, I'm very accessible. Uh, and yeah, I, I appreciate you. Appreciate your insight. Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, thanks for having me. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.